one of the people I went to was Justin Green. He's an incredible composer. So I'm sitting there and I'm just playing him my music. I don't know why he gave me the time of day also. It's like a little schnook then, you know? Can I come over and I'm, you're, com okay. Anyways, I went to his house in Seagate and I'm playing him stuff and he liked the stuff and he gave me encouragement and he says, I, I don't think you're gonna make it. <laughs> He's, he's very straight up. No, he was so he was saying a compliment, but I'll explain to you why. He's like, "Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. I am a beardless Yaakov Linger. That's right, the beard is off for now. And this week, I got to sit down with the one, the only Rabbi Baruch Levine, someone who I've wanted to speak to for a while, and this is his first podcast ever. You will hear about the incredible." Twillery, my favorite clothing company brand, and you'll also hear about how the Chavetz Chaim guaranteed, this is a guarantee, will change your life. This episode is in memory of Shimon David Ben Yaakov Shleime, as well as Miriam Sarbas Yaakov Moshe. Also stick around to the very end because something integral Baruch and I forgot to talk about that I want to say at the very end of this episode. Here is my conversation with the celeb, the special, the rabbi, Baruch Levine. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. You came in all the way from Waterbury, so thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me. I'm not sure, and I even referred to you, and then like I kind of felt a little dumb. Do I refer to you as Rabbi or Baruch? Baruch. Yeah? Yes. Because you are a Rebbe. I'm a Rebbe. I have smicha too, but I'm Baruch Levine. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I guess you're telling me them. You're you're probably Rabbi. Not telling me don't call me Rabbi Levine or Rebbe, of course. But I don't know. You know, I have a few relatives that you know your CDs should say Rabbi Baruch Levine. And I, is ex- that a thing? Do which is there a singer that does that? It's not the Rabbi many- Baruch Chait, maybe. Mm. But I, I, my answer is, uh, you know, I want to, I, I want to be in the arena of mainstream Jewish music. You know, and I want to put out a certain kind of music, but. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, Rabbi, Rabbi Barclay is like, oh, that's a Torah tape, you know, which, which is great. Right, <laughs> but right, right. It's, it's not what I'm trying to do. So. Got it. Okay. Barclay. Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into like, I guess the two different identities you have, one as a singer and one as a Rebbe, but take us back to the beginning growing up in Toronto. Grew up in Toronto. Um, went to, my father was a Rebbe in Eitz Chaim. That's the school I attended, Eitz Chaim schools, somewhere in the center, very beautiful school. Um... I loved music, like like since I was like a little kid. Was Actually, your family into music? My grandfather, my my great grandfather was a big cousin. Mm. Um, musical, not like you know, not crazy. No, it was kind of like that's where I got it from. Um, even in nursery, my 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 teachers were saying how you know I think I had some report cards. Even how I sing nicely by davening. Um, in my one of my nursery classes. I had the daughter of Rip Shlomo Karlbach was in my class. Wow. Yeah. He lived in Toronto. I mean, his family lived in Toronto. He used to come in and he visited us a few times. Like, I really remember him coming in with his guitar. You think Rip Shlomo Karlbach, like singing in a, you know, we call it the Ma'agal, the circle for, for us there. So it was wow. really cool. Um, and that was, you know, um, and then I was sang in the school choirs, so musical was always part of my life. Toronto then didn't have like a organized uh, choir. You know, the Toronto Boys Choir was before my time. Um, so I just really, uh, I don't know. You know, my parents saw how whenever I'd pass the piano, I'd figure things out. It was a talent that I had by ear. And they invested and bought me a little keyboard and I had some lessons. Um, and then eventually I would just, I wouldn't have the patience to read the notes because I, I, I play by ear. I would just, you know, play the songs. Um, didn't have like a lot of singing, well, camp, and then of course camp. Mm. What camp do you go to? Camp, I go to Toronto mm. many years. And really, you know, camp is just amazing. We're in camp season now. It's like my son's in camp. He's, you get so much from it. Um, so I really, you know, Bar Hashem there, I was able to develop my talent and, my parents would, I was already then, I don't know, 10 years old and, you know, soloist in color war. And my parents would write these letters like they'd hear about it back in the city and they'd be, you know, just remember to conduct yourself with humility. And which is, of course, something that I try to carry, you know, to, to today. Um, so that's where I had a lot of musical development. 
Um, but you weren't even, if I if I know correctly, you. I don't even know that makes. I don't even know if that sentence makes sense. But you weren't even like I guess going towards becoming a singer. Yeah. It was more of a composer. Yeah, I, I didn't even start composing. I I was just I, I I sang. I was a kid who sang. Like mm-hmm. like you know. I remember there was people that wanted me to sing at their weddings. Like a you know, counselors from camp who'd get married wanted me to sing at their chuvas, and my parents were like, "No, you know, <laughs> you sing where you're supposed to sing." And composing happened when. I got my little keyboard and I was playing in the basement one day and my father was like saying, like, what song is that? I'd never heard it before. I said, well, neither have I. (laughs) Um, And then I got into composing. I started composing and it was like a whole world. It was really something that, you know, it was nice to have that outlet. It's, you know, I was in school and then yeshiva and I had some very nice opportunities. Like Toronto had... You know, you had A.B. Rottenberg lived a few blocks away from me. Um, I was also, I was a child solo on his uh, Vegas album, Journeys, The Golden Crown. Uh, Hamalach. Hamalach. Yeah. yeah. You're the voice. You're I'm the kid of Hamalach. Wow. Yeah. That's so, pretty cool. I feel like really you could have cool. like hung up every old, you're like, you're, got, you're done. You're the kid on Hamalach. You're good to go. I was 12 and A.B. made me sing it 50 times Wow. in the studio. Like not too hard, not too soft, not too... I just remember being there and just, you know, I'm all, just like he wanted it a certain way. Um, when he came to my house to teach me the song, I, I have like, when, whenever you're presenting a song for the first time, it, no one goes gaga over it. It's right. just, it, 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 it's not like that. I remember even when uh, the first Pesach, Vihi Shamda came out and I was doing all these bunch of concerts with Yochi and I said, I love this song. And he's like, well, nobody knows it yet, you know, but it takes time. So anyways, He's coming there. He's teaching me the song Hamalach, and my mother's there, and she's listening, and she's like, "Aby, you think this song is is gonna make it?" And he's so humble, Aby. Right? Yeah. But he also of... knows what he knows his stuff. He knows he... His, he knows music. <laughs> he knows music. He says, "You know, Mrs. Levine, if this song doesn't make it, I think I may as well quit my career right now." Oh. I think he said that, but he's you know. Um, Would you consider him? I guess like your music rebbe. Totally, yeah. If for in, in a large sense, in a lot of what I do, because he's a singer songwriter, and you know, but um, I perform a little more, you know. Mm. So I like him on one end for sure, and then there's there's a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I look out a lot. Like Avram Fried is such a good person and a great performer. So maybe I I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. Interesting. You know? Do you, you have any Avram Fried stories? I'm sure you have a bunch. Um, I had one recently. I had it during COVID. This is an amazing story because it's not just a, I'll get to it. Um, we were singing at, a, at one of these backyard COVID weddings way up in the Hamptons and it was really in the thick of it. And it was like people were asking us for videos all day long. Like people really were alone in the bar mitzvah kids and that whole thing. And there were days where just like, it was, it was exhausting, but, but you did it, you know? And I went up to him, and we were so before the chuppah, we were doing a chuppah together. And I said, Remel, like I like I was like fetching, like, so how many videos did you do today? <laughs> like, and he's like, Baruch, not enough, not enough. <laughs> it, was like, it was it was like, I'm 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 litfish, I'm a yeshiva, you know. So like, we have Torah of and give me less but like, it's all three, you know. So like. Taira for sure is something that, you know, you're also, you want to use Jeeva. Right, yeah, like, it's, it's very prominent. In the there's a way that Gimilas Chassan. And it was like a, it was, it was a nice story. Nothing like, you know. Right, wow. Okay, so I, I want to I wanna get back to AB and, <laughs> and all the music and Avram Fried. Yeah. But I, I do want to ask you, what, for people who don't know you, what is your day job? So I'm a Rebbe. You're a Rebbe. I, I'm a Rebbe. This is interesting. I'm in the middle of, um, Trans, what do you call it? Transitioning. I was a Rebbe in Waterbury Base Manager for three years. And then I was a Rebbe in Yeshiva Katana, fifth grade for 17 years. Okay. Um, why I didn't teach for 18 years is because I don't want them to honor me at the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and, and what, so what are you becoming now? So now, and so, and it, it, I love teaching. I love the classroom, but I, I, I travel very often and the school is so good to me. 
and Baruch Hashem, I'm a good Rebbe, and they're accommodating. But for me to come, you know, and I come back to school, but like, you know, missing and substitutes, and it's it was hard for me. And I, at this point, I took this past year the Torah Masora Mashkiach course, which is like really they're putting in schools, Mashkiach all over the country, where where at this point, like helping kids with social emotional stuff, and I'm also going to be mentoring Rebbeim, and mm. there's a the, the community is growing, the school is growing, there's new Rebbeim coming, so I'm excited to do that. Still going to be there full time, but it won't have that that pressure, which is which was very hard for me. It's yeah, I, I think just stop being a Rebbe these days is. is it's it's a full time job. It's it's yeah. it, it always has been, but even more so now with just I guess the the increased needs of of every child. Yeah. But then on top of it, the fact that you're traveling to I mean do the silly podcast, but then also traveling to do like you know weddings and and events and everything in between that, it's a lot to do. And also more than that, it's also for your identity. It's interesting because like you kind of and I think you do a good job at it, like really split the worlds of being a Rebbe, being a singer. Yeah, yeah. I, everyone asks, like, do you bring music into your class? I'm like, not so much more or less than other Rebbeim, you know, it's classes, class, and, I, you know, we sing by davening, and I know what keys to start on, and, you know, we have a nice Haskalas Gemara program, but it is two different worlds. I think I do have an advantage, like, I think the kids are proud to have me as their Rebbe, they mm. can tell their friends, so that's for sure an edge that, helps with with management and stuff like that but definitely how do like do you bedafka like try to focus on i hate using the word because like it's maybe a non-jewish word but like celebrity because like at the end of the day you're a celebrity you are singing like people know you they know your voice but at the same time you strike me as a very non-celebrity celebrity i'm non-celebrity like is that it, it works for like, me and it works against mm-hmm. me. Um, I'll tell you a story. When I when I first started, um, whatever I, I can get, we, we can go back to my. I'll skip to when I was dating. Okay, when I was dating my wife, I already had composed some you know formidable. Is that the word? Formidable, formidable stuff. Like what? Give me like um, what have you composed by that point? I composed already Chasso for Shweki. Um, you know the song Hanukkah one, right? Composed a lot of songs for Yehuda, Yehuda exclamation point. Right. Composed some songs for A for uh, Aish, A B Rottenberg, mm. uh, Yisrael Williger. Like I, you know, a little you're, you're song selling there. business. Right. I was a Bachar Yeshiva. My parents were, they were incredible. They they, you know, now kids are sending demos left and right, and and it's very easy to put out a demo. So sometimes it's hard to listen because it was so easy to, to make, but they would, every band is on and they would rent a studio for me and any, you know, all the songs that I came up in my head during Muster Seder, I, <laughs> uh, I was able to record and sell and, you know, so, but it wasn't like, some people that knew me knew me, but like when I was dating, I was telling my wife, um, you know, I compose songs. And she's like, well, what does that mean? I said, well, sometimes, you know, when singers are on their albums, if it's more like a bit album freed, some songs they make up on their own, but I think largely they are composed by other people. So she's like, yeah, that's interesting. And we were walking in the New York City, the Waldorf Astoria, and she's, uh, there's a piano there. She says, compose one right now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, I wrote one. Way. I wrote Elokai Neshama. There. Is, uh, yeah. I think most of it. It was like a four-part song on my first album. You should have gone on like <laughs> like way more dates with her because then you would have had like albums yeah, for stuff. years. Wow. So and then when I got married, again it was you know it was let's start a life. We were learning in Merushalayim and you know raise a family. It was when I would send these demos out, so these producers would listen, various producers, and they'd say like, "Mark, you have a nice voice. You can develop it." and you don't have to sell songs. Like I'll, I'll, I'll fund your album. You'll, you'll put something, something out. Um, one of the people I went to was Yossi Green. He is an incredible composer. I just spoke to him today. I said, Yossi, can I say this story? He's like, I never. I'll tell you what he said. And he said, I never said that, but he did. <laughs> he said it, Yossi. But he's the best. We're, we're very close, and just, I don't come to his toes in composing. I mean, he's a talmud chacham. He's everything. So, I'm sitting there and I'm playing him my music. I don't know why he gave me the time of day. Also. It's like a little schnook then, you know? Can I come over and I'm, you're, com- okay. Anyways, I went to his house in Seagate and I'm playing him stuff and he liked the stuff and he gave me encouragement and he says, 
I, I don't think you're going to make it. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's very straight up. No, he was so, he was saying a compliment, but I'll explain to you why. He's like, you're just a normal guy. <laughs> you weren't off the derech and went on the derech and on or went off or had a story or had trauma or had, you know, or, or you're not Hasidish, you don't have a long beard and you're not Svarty and a funny accent. You're just a regular normal guy. That's so funny. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think he has a point, uh, not that you won't make it, but he has a point out. It's like, there is something, I get, Towards a celebrity or towards a singer, when there's a story there, it it does it does add an extra layer. But on the flip side, because quote unquote you're a normal guy, it's also you're a lot more relatable. Like yeah. the fact that you're just you're not just, but like you're a rebbe and you happen to sing and you into music. Like there's something so yeah cool about it. I don't know. I hate to be like cliche, but like it's nice. It's like a breath of fresh air of like just a normal guy who has a great voice and sings. No, and people really like, so many people rely, like I get such feedback and quality feedback from like, you know, people want their children to look up to, you know, to be a role model. So that's like, just to be a normal growing Bentoro, which again, I'm not there yet, but I'm trying. <laughs> and um, so that's, it has it work against you because People like celebs to be, you know, out of touch, sometimes a little different, a little, right. a little you know, yeah. circus acts in a certain way. I don't mean like, like a lot of gigs today, people are hiring, like, just interesting. It, it's fine, you know? There's, right. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. There's, there's some, you know, someone's making this lavish event. They want it to be extreme in every sense of the word. Right. So, therefore... I guess in a certain way, when you think of Baruch Levine the singer, you're not extreme right. at all. Yeah. So okay, maybe you won't fit that, but I right. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's like no, there's 100%. just different people look for different <laughs> things, and there's enough. Like I don't also like I think it's an interesting fact. Not many people bring up enough. There's never been as many Yidden as there are today, or people in the world. It's incredible. There's I so know, many, so that just creates a need for more. There's a lot. Like, I was just, like, looking at, like, I don't know if it was Ami or Rishpach. Like, there's always constantly, like, again, I'm not Hasidic, so I just don't know Hasidic. Like, there's, when we were young, when I'm not, you're a little older than me, not that much, but, like, when I was younger, like, there was a few singers that you knew about, yeah. and everyone knew about, and that was it. Today, there are multiple singers that I have no clue, and thousands of people know who they are. It's a crazy industry. It's 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 a, like a service industry. It's almost like there's going to be a dinner there. Who's going to be the music? Who's going to fit here? Who's going to fit there? It's a whole world. It really is. And people always like they ask me like, Bar, how do you how do you stay in your lane all this time? Like my music didn't. It changes in a certain in a sense where the quality of the recordings and mm -hmm. there's you have to there's styles that naturally change. But really, I always wanted to. My, my, you know, what touches my heart is like, you know, good, heart sick. It doesn't have to be slow, it could be fast. It doesn't have to be like, you know, not depressing, just like good traditional, you know, Jewish music. So my answer really is like, I, it's it's easier to stay in my lane because there's not much traffic anymore, hmm. you know? Doing so your people, own thing. Yeah, doing other, there are, listen, people ask about Jewish music. It's like, there's definitely black and white. There's definitely music, which is like, everyone will agree. This is what we sing in shul and it's, uh, is like music, and there's definitely music which is for sure not, but the gray is so, so, so big. It's such a good lesson. I, I guess I'm taking it for myself, but I think anyone could take it for themselves. I'm clearly not a singer, but but I think staying in your lane, like focusing in what you're good at, what you're appreciated for, yeah. that's such a good message because so often, especially with social media, like you're exposed to like, that person did this and doing that, and you're like, Oh, maybe I should try to it's hard. do that and like wait, that doesn't really match who I am. Right. So why right. you're hundred percent right. It makes it so much easier. Like I'm not doing that because that guy does that much better than I would do that. Mm. So I'm gonna just continue to do what I do and be the best I can be and and you know, challenge myself to write better and whatever. Give the people rely like people really I feel people rely on me and many, many others, you know, mm -hmm. I try to keep to that. Okay. So I want to go back to the classroom. <laughs> I want to go back to the classroom. To the classroom. And, um, <laughs> I mean, it's probably, we could spend a entire episode just talking about Chinuch, but like what, you know, being in the field for so long 
And by the way, a part of me doesn't even believe you that you're you're Rebbe for so long because you 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 look like you're like maybe two years older than me. Wow. <laughs> but you. um, which you told me before, you're a grandparent. I'm a Zaidi. You're a Zaidi. It blows my I mind. I don't know what I'm being called yet. Zaidi, Zayda. Oh, not sure. I'm not sure. You have like a year or two <laughs> until she's young. I have yeah. a little granddaughter in Yerushalayim. Wow. Hashem. Yeah. Still, yeah, part of me doesn't believe and you. And two couples there, so Thousands. shout out to to uh, Gabi and Nakama and Yisrael and Tova. Wow, if you're, you know, they're watching this whenever, whenever they will watch it. Yeah, That's on twenty four six. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Twenty four six is great. Um, so yeah, part of me doesn't believe that your grandparents have two married children, but um, you're chinuch for so long. Like, what what would you like say is is like what a child needs today as and talking, I guess, to a parent or talking, maybe there's children listening or watching us. Right. I, it's so interesting. I, I, I'm teaching for 17 years. I definitely have seen a, a huge shift. We recently brought in, your brother had him on Kosher Money. You're about Joey Haber? Yeah, he's great. He's amazing. He, we brought him into Waterbury to speak at a, at a function. And he said something which, he articulated something that I, I just like knew in my heart. And he said, like, Chinuch evolved. Over the years, you know, after the war, during the war, it was survival. When you're surviving, you have no time to be in touch with your feelings, whether you feel happy or sad. You, you, you feel hungry, you take a piece of bread, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then when we built Torah back in America, it was still the same survival. Um, and then after we established ourselves again, it was discipline, you know? The way it was done in the Heim has to be like this, you know? And then that created, there was fallout. So then after that came love, 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 love. And that also had its fallout because, you know, it's just like, it, it, it you know, created such a permissive society. But I noticed something that he articulated that today, kids really want you to get them. They are, they are in a certain sense, as much as the doors, you know, there's definitely you read us the and maybe the grit is less, and maybe the, I don't know, but the the science, like the sophistication, and like them being in, they're carrying so much in their heads, and they want you to relate to them, you know, more in an adult fashion. Like it used to be classroom management was like the key. You know, coming into a class was like managing your classroom and procedures, and you know, you're doing this because Rebbe said so. Now I'm not saying today, you let kids, you know, let the inmates run the asylum. <laughs> Not at all. You have a good structured classroom, but you got to relate to them as human beings who are carrying. He said, everybody, hey, he said, the kids today are carrying in their heads what our grandparents carried on their backs. They're mm -hmm. carrying so much. So, you know, that's like one thing. Another thing is like parents are li a little bit fearful, a little bit like, you know, to say no, hmm. to say no. It makes, I mean, I, I, I have a two and a half year old. It's true. I, I'm, I, I don't want to upset him, you know, but at the end of the day, it's like, I am the parent. He's the child. Right. There's, there's a hierarchy over here, but you're saying what people generally, They're afraid to say no because they're afraid the kids, you know, going to go off them. or going to rebel mm. or won't love them or, or it's too much. They're mm. afraid it's too much. There is definitely a balance. Some there, sometimes there is too much for right. sure. But like, if you, if your kid knows that you get them, and your, your Talmud and Shir knows you understand them, you know, and it's hard to teach that. Like, you have to really get them. You have to really be interested in them. Then they know you, you could say no. I, have, I had a story when I was a kid. Like, this is, um, I'm sure my parents are listening, mommy and daddy. <laughs> but um, there was, again, like, we talked about music before. Not a lot of music in Toronto. I remember Miami Boys Choir came once. So that concert we went to, I actually... I craved it so much. I broke into the dressing room during like uh, re the intermission. Oh wow! They were singing it. Baruch Habab B'Shem Hashem. Like a real, you know, like threw me out. <laughs> Get out <of> <laughs> but um, I still joke about it with him today. But anyways, there was another concert in Toronto. A big singer came in, um, and a friend of mine offered tickets that I can go with his family. And I was like, wow, good tickets. And my parents didn't want me to go. They said it's not the right environment for you. You know, I was maybe in seventh grade, eighth grade. And I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> like, are you serious? Um, and they didn't want me to go, but you know what they did? So that night, I mean, my parents were busy. They, I hope they remember this. They took me out to pizza and then we had ice cream. And I, I loved playing ping pong with my father. We went to my grandfather's house, my grandparents' house. Um, 
in Toronto and we played ping pong and they spent like hours with me and it was okay. I was, was I disappointed? Yeah. Do I, you know, but I'm, they, my mother-in-law just told my wife and I recently, my in-laws are, my father-in-law was recently in after his yard site in, in a few, few days. Um, amazing person. But my mother-in-law told us that, you remember those like popsicles that had like the two sticks on the bottom? Yeah, yeah, sure. Right? So used to, she says it used to be that you would split the popsicle and each kid would get half a popsicle, but a whole mother. Mm. Says, Today, you give the kids the whole pop, throw them the whole box, <laughs> but they have half a mother. You know, mm. it's, so we need to, we just need to be there for them. That's, it's a good point. I mean, to your, to your point that the fact that you still remember the story and I'm sure, I'm sure you still, if you go back in time, would have wanted to go to that I wanted, concert. Yeah. I'm still disappointed. But, but, but you didn't. still, your, your parents, I guess, replaced it with, not replaced it, but like there was discipline, but there was also love there. So it didn't yeah. take away from. Love and understanding. And I knew that, and, and it was, it was authentic. They weren't like, they, they had their reasons, whether I agreed with it or not. Kids, they, they, kids could sniff this stuff out. Like you can't fool them. You know, there's no such thing as like saying something that you don't mean and pretending to love them and being nice and not meaning it. There's no such thing. Wow. We'll be right back this week's episode. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll notice that I have two pairs of pants. I'm not wearing two pairs of pants. I'm wearing one pair of pants and I'm holding up another pair of pants. I, I promised you this, that I will prove to you that I have my pair of pants from Twillery. This is over five years old. It looks great. I actually wore this past three days. So it's, it looks pretty good for pants that have been worn um, in three days. So this is it. Uh, listen, Jakob Langer, I just got my beard taken off by choice for my wife. Happy birthday, Gita. And and I, I kind of feel like a new me. And if you've been watching the episodes lately of Inspiration for the Nation, my mother is very happy. My wife's very happy. And one of my best friends, Tzvi Haber, who I would consider him my, my stylist because he would be there to tell me to stand straight. He'll tell me which, literally which sneakers to order and just help me not look like a schlump. I, it's something that I struggle with, but something that is so much easier for me now is the fact that I started getting clothing from Twiller. You can see me in the past few interviews rocking their polos, their blazer. I have like the official Inspiration for the Nation blazer is through Twillery that I like so much, by the way, that for Yuntif, I ordered their suit, their ear suit or something. It's I'm not exactly sure what it's called. I'm very excited for it. It just the pants feel amazing and it lasts. I literally have pants from them for over five years and you could tap into the magic of Twillery and feel your best, look your best and wear clothing that is, it's, I'll be honest, it's not cheap, but the amount of money that it will save you in the long run it's it's a game changer. Literally, again, a pair of pants for over five years. Don't worry, guys. I have other pairs of pants from Twillery. It's not the only one, but I just I think it's amazing that I have a pant, pair of pants for them for so long and is by far my favorite pair of pants, my favorite polos, my favorite everything. Okay, you heard enough about me talking about Twillery. Go ahead and support our channel by getting Twillery and looking your best. You can go to Twillery.com and use the code word INSPIRE. That's code word INSPIRE for $18 off when you spend over $139. And if you're like, I don't know my size, guys, it's, it's basically free shipping when you spend over that amount and free returns. Their customer service is immaculate. I literally just ordered a suit and, and I wasn't sure. I reached out to them, bada bing, bada boom answered within the hour. They're amazing. Go ahead and use Twillery. Feel your best, look your best, and they are the best. Twillery.com slash inspire. Now back to this week's episode. Okay, I want to <laughs> transition into the Seema Shas, which, okay. which I, I can't even begin to wrap my head around what it's like to be singing. It's probably the most watched Jewish event ever. I don't know, like, yeah. like I don't know. I, I don't, from every <laughs> probably, it's crazy. So, so you sing by the past two Siema Shasas. Yeah. Okay, take me back through the first one. Like, do do they bring you in? Do they give you a phone call? Like, what? what how I was that uh, in my parents' cottage in Bellevue in Toronto. Hmm. Did I say it right? Toronto. Toronto. I, I yeah. lost my accent. <laughs> no, no, you still got it. You got the Toronto. Uh, Toronto like rolls and. I got a call. It was must have been a week before the CM, maybe less. Um, you know, in, to be honest, like in my mind, it was like how amazing would it be if I could, if I would ever sing at the CM. But like, what was I thinking? I was just like, like in the back of your head type. The scene was in two thousand eight. The Vizakani album came out in two thousand six. The song did not go viral, 
which was like a good thing. I think when songs go viral today, they go, they're hot and then they're not, mm. you know? Um, so, but it, but it was rising, rising, right. rising, it rising, rising. Slow it's rise. Slow rise. You know, even my voice then, I can't listen to that. I can't <laughs> listen. You should do like a re-recording <laughs> of like the version of it. I know, I know. Off the record, maybe? I think. <laughs> we'll get there, we'll, we'll get, there. get there, we'll get there off the record. So I get a call from Ding. Um, his brother is part of the Aguda and, you know, Suki and Ding, another gold Ding. And he said, you know, we were just at a meeting and Abish brought us singing at the CM and they want him to sing the song with Zakeini. They want him to sing the song. And I said, I mean, this is like, you know, I owe him so much. Ding, I'm sure you're listening. And I said, and, and I said that, why don't we get Baruch Levine to sing it? You know, it's, he's younger and he'll track a certain, you know, and not, I don't mean younger than, you know, Abish is, he's, he's still, we're still close. Meaning like there's a, there's a, a generation different, different that's gonna demographic, yeah. relate, yeah. different demographic. Um, and they're like, you know, he's new. He doesn't have a beard, you know, which is all fair. This is like the CMA shots. Right. You know? you, yeah. You're representing a lot of people. Um, it's like when you see he doesn't have a beard, I think of like Yom Kippur, you know, like the, the chazan yeah. is like supposed to be like a certain age and chazan, have yeah. a beard, a family, right. So yeah, you're you're representing Klal Yisrael there. Yeah. And I got to call, you know, I called and tell, he said, no, so then Rabbi Shlomo Gert, uh, Gertzlin called me from the Gudda. And he said, we're going to do it. He said, you can't tell us all. You know, I told then my producer, Yochi Briskman, um, my wife, he says, you just come to the stadium and when it's time to get up there, they actually did put me in the program, but by the time you got to the stadium, the programs were, you know, on your chair already. Um, and I sang and it was a really, um, I was so nervous, so, so, so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> How many people were there around? I don't know, 90,000 or whatever, wow. whatever it was. Um, and that's who's there, all the people watching and listening after. Yeah, I could still watch it, you know? My hat was very wide then. You know? <laughs> so, like, that was yeah, the style. That was the style. And yeah, when I, it was actually another lesson I learned. And I was singing and it was hard to be in touch with like the masses, right? So there was like a group of people that are like in front of the stage. And during the song, you know, what helps us with our nervousness is you see people you know that you could relate with, like even at a concert, and you could kind of minimize the, the masses to create, creating some sort right, of, you know, a personal moment. So you feel, feel. And there was a fellow there who was, he was sick, and we knew him, he was recently nifter. And I saw him, and I like, gave him like a, like a nod and a wink. And I got flagged for it after, not from the Aguda, but... What was the flag? The flag was like, it's not covered at Sibor. Mm. You know, you're 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 singing for ninety thousand people. You close your eyes, right? You I think guess about what you're doing. You're mm. not. It's not. It's not a concert. A walk in the this park. Isn't a concert, it's not a concert. Which, which, which is you should be doing those kind of stuff, right? right. I, I I hear I hear <laughs> I I can hear either side. I understand still why you did it, and I'm sure right. you know what. Even if it was wrong, I mean, at, at least that person, I'm sure they felt like hundred percent dollars. You know, there's something to that. And you live and learn. You try not to make the same mistake. So if again, if it was a mistake, you, I, I, you, I understood it. Did you do it by the second one? No. Nope. No. <laughs> <laughs> was, okay, so, and what was the experience like by the second one? Were you, because I could see you either being less nervous or I could see you being more nervous, like you did it and like this is the next level and like you, now you really don't want to mess up, like which. Right, the second like, yeah. one was, again, I didn't take it for granted. I wasn't expecting it. The call came. Um, and I was singing the second one, like literally with next to Abish Brat, that was like very nice for me because he has been someone who was at the Seum and for, for so long. Um, and it, it did hit me harder then. Like I welled up when I was singing there. Mm. Like I was happy that I was able to, you know, to feel it on that level. And just, I, it's, I, I don't know. I'm, I was overwhelmed with a feeling of humility, you know, like why me? Why this? But you have to kind of just, you have to perform. You do have to perform. Yeah. You have to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's not just <laughs> singing. It's it's a lot of people eyeballs on you. But I, I, I get it. I understand why you were chosen out of everyone else. I mean, again, not that anyone else is bad, but like you said before, there's different, different singers have different images and the image that you represent. Yeah. I, I also, I don't even know how many singers are Rabbeim as well. Like, Right. It's, you know what I mean? Like, all right. So I, I learned, it's interesting when you're saying about image. I learned that image is, is something, is important. 
it's it doesn't mean you're from or less from. There are many like Hasidic organizations that won't that won't have me. You know, it's fine. You know, there are many singers that won't perform in mixed concerts. Not, like, but they'll they'll do like a mixed Pesach program. But images, people brand themselves that way, mm-hmm. and it's it is what it is. I'm not like. You know, I get sometimes it works for me and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> so so speaking about image and uh, you're involved in some form of controversy, I'm like, I'm painting it like it's more than it is because I don't think it really was. But like, yeah. could you, I guess, describe, I guess, your experience with the song? Like, I mean, I'm not even, I'm not even exactly sure. What? The, the Nishaya Diriya Torah of Atalis. I think so. Is yeah, that that's was that the one? Yeah, I don't. I hope I'm not a controversial no, figure. No, I'm, that I'm, was con- I'm being was sarcastic. <laughs> I'm being 100 percent sarcastic okay. for anyone like, who's not oh, realizing. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> not at all. Like I think you're the furthest thing from a controversy. Thank you. Um, but yeah, like what what happened there? And like so, uh, yeah, it was very hard. That was a hard matzav. Like uh, whenever I perform, I, my tefillah is always. We say in benching. We say it every day. I want to perform that Hashem should be proud. People should be proud. You know, it should, people should like it. It's an important thing. You know, we say uh, that every day in the morning, um, mm-hmm. but so this Neshea Dira Torah was a video that, you know, the Dira Torah in Lakewood that you know has this, all the, the honoring and giving COVID to the younger light that are really being my and nefesh and my wife is from Lakewood I'm, I'm I consider myself very much part of I live in Waterbury but my in-laws from Lakewood originally um, and a few months later they wanted to honor the Nisheya Direya Torah right like you know the men are getting this credit um, and the women are behind the scenes you know, who's allowing the husband to sit and learn all day? You know, again, whether you agree with Kolo, lifestyle, not, this is Lakewood, this is something we have and something that we, you know, that's a, we should appreciate and cherish. And the, so they, they, they created a video and the whole idea of the video, it was written by a woman, Mrs. Hyland Newhouse. It was run by women, produced by women, the whole thing, lyrics, too, and everything. And they just, they I guess they wanted me to sing it because, you do get more of a, you know, Bono Olam also does. They have songs that definitely relate to women, but women do sing it too. Mm-hmm. But they wanted an audience that I'm sure would definitely hear it, or maybe in Lakewood they'll be more comfortable with that, whatever it is. And they played this song at their Neshe Adira Torah event. Like there was maybe seven, 8,000 women there. And I got such beautiful feedback. And people called my wife and they said, you know, it was, I, I just sang the song. I was hired to sing the song. I, I definitely connect, anything I sing, I connect to. I don't compose everything I sing. Um, and then, and I was getting nice feedback on WhatsApp and email. And then the song went, the song and the video went out on Instagram. I don't have Insta- I don't have Instagram on my phone. I have an account and have like tons of followers. I got a lot of followers after this. <laughs> But um, my, I have guys that, you know, two people that I work with and they, they find what I do and they put it out. Right, it's, right. It's a it's, it's Today it's like a website. It's, I show my wares. I don't right. really relate to people on Instagram. And there was like a huge backlash because it didn't show the women's faces. And then it was like, I feel like that was like, that was the whole point. You know, when you're learning something and, and your says, he goofa. Uh. Meaning... This video, the words were, um, it's early in the morning, every street corner is humming. They're describing the scene in Lakewood in the morning, everyone's, you know, and says, but there's a steady pulse, not always heard, not always seen, but felt beneath the surface, one that's quiet and serene. Then the chorus, that, you know, was describing these women who are behind the scenes. That was the point. Mm. Like, that you know the men are getting this covered, but it's like you're making it happen. But it was like a trigger because people took it like you know hide the women, don't show the women. Like it's the it's it, ironic. It, I guess it's a little ironic because some, you know. sometimes like you know sometimes people are coming from and I, I don't I, I don't know exactly who who was 
complaining or, or had their ideas, but like they're coming from like, what I, I'm assuming is like, we want women to be represented, but ironically, the women here who wrote the song and who it's they about, want it. they don't want it. They, they, want, they it. want, this is yeah. how they want to be represented. Yeah. So I, I, I get they it. Don't want it. I get, but I, get I, it. I, I felt it wasn't like, if you just thought for a moment, if you just considered for a moment what it's for, they just saw right away, you know, and there was like one or two influencers that just went, they, I don't know. And do they know right. you personally? No, of course no, not. No, right. and they didn't reach out. Right. No one it's reached never out. Like, it's, it's not never nice. like, right. I, it's, it's one sad. of their husband came to me. Really? Like a few weeks later and said, uh, you know, I apologize for it. Wow. Uh, yeah, because he, uh, listen, in hindsight, I don't know if a video like that belongs on Instagram. It's it's a certain target audience and mm. right for better and for worse. I mean, it's, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, listen. I, if there's anyone who, tough. Know, who knows about tough. putting stuff out on internet, on <laughs> oh, the you, internet. You're, you're, yeah, okay. yeah. No, it's people. People will always complain, no matter what. Like literally, and 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 I. You see this in the. I'm not comparing us to the Torah, but I am. But like with Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Moshe Rabbeinu is leading everyone, and he's he's literally. Hashem's like, I'm going to destroy the Yid, and I'm going to keep just Moshe. We'll start with you, and Moshe's like, no, like if I, I have the Yidin, I, like he's someone who goes above and beyond, and then like you have Kaira coming in, and like Moshe doesn't really care about the Yidin, and it's like, are you kidding me? Like, so if Moshe Rabbeinu dealt with it, like, you know, the greatest leader of all, uh, of all time, clearly, so it's just the nature of things. Like right. anything that goes out in the world, there's always people that, yeah. that complain and have something. And you know what? I, you never know. Like maybe they're going through something that- 100%. You know, like we don't no, know. the pain was, there's, I'm not, there's certain women that were like really pained and I just, okay, maybe I'll watch this and have a bit of, there are, there's other, I'm, I'm hired to do- people are gonna watch this and be upset. <laughs> they're still gonna be like, what are you saying? The point is- There's but, other things I was hired to do that they have women on it. Right. Like it's not like- Right, right. You know, inappropriate, you know, obviously you don't think something can I get Allah and it has to be appropriate, etc. but- Right. I'll tell you something funny, like behind the scenes, there's the person who produced the video, Mint Media, Maishi Schindler is like, Baruch, there's not much to show in this video. We need, we need you in it. And I'm like, I, I don't belong in this. I, I, I'm just singing this song. I'm trying. To, it's like, no, we need. I don't like uh, fighting with people. He's like, let's take the footage, and hmm. if, and then we'll we'll see. I said, you know, you could take the footage. So there was some Mushy Breeze and Waterbury is a big video videographer. Matthew Brookwitz is also by us. So he videoed me singing it, and I'm like, I said, I, I'm not comfortable with it. I, I should not be in this video. And they talk showed it to. Like one of the Rashiv is like, well, why is he in it? Hmm. So my hands are in it. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I'm playing piano, but I, I'm not in it. You're not in it. I'm not in it. Right. I'm just, you know. Okay, we will be right back this week's episode, but the goal of Inspiration for the Nation, the honest goal is here to help you live a better life by hearing the lives of others. There's someone who's been suggested for the show a lot of times, a lot of times. And, you know, maybe we'll have him on one day. His name is Reb Menasha. He's a Cheder Rebbe, and he has... I don't know the exact number. I think like over 370 stories about people who have taken on themselves to be careful with Shmir Shalasran and learn the Chafas Chaim's Svarim, um, in particular Chafas Chaim, a daily companion that's the famous, amazing, incredible Chafas Chaim Sefer. He, I, I spoke to Rabbi Rahimi who is telling me incredible stories. By the way, we'll link in the bottom of the show notes Rabbi Rahimi's uh, video uh, that he put out just talking about the power of watching what we say and uh, guarding our tongue. But the, I'll give you one story. There was a story that there was a girl and she had two siblings, a brother and a sister that were divorced. And she said, you know what? I have a friend that's that's a little older looking for a shidduch. Let me take Take this on. I've heard the wild, incredible stories from Rebbe Menashe. Let me take this on. She got she got a chavrusa shaft with her friend. Within the year, her brother who was divorced, her sister was divorced, and her friend who was older, uh, a little older, they all got married. But the kicker is the brother. I'm getting chills. The brother got engaged on the yard site of the Chavetz Chaim, and the Rebbe Menashe has literally hundreds of stories. Someone actually heard that story. A uh, 37 year old uh, single fellow that's divorced. And he's like, Come on, is that true? And Menashe's like, No, 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 I'm telling you it's true. You got to sit down, you got to learn the safer every day, consistency, and, and this will change your life. That person within the year got, well, he sent a Menashe invitation to his wedding. 
these stories are not made up. They are 100% real and true. And you know what? Hashem runs the world. And when we show him that we care about all his children and we guard our tongue and we make sure not to say anything negative about anyone else, it really changes our lives, changes who we are. And if you go to in the link in the show notes and to artschool.com, I'm pretty sure the, the, the safer is like around $16, which is a steal, sixteen dollars to get you into Olam Haba. Your life will be changed. This, this, this movement is changing the world. You've heard about Chavetz Chaim. I know you did it when you were younger, but and you you watched what you said. But let's be honest, you, you maybe haven't been on top of guarding your tongue as much as you can. Join us and continue your pathway to meet bringing more peace onto this world. Go ahead, get the book, watch Rabbi Yahimi's video, and now back to this week's episode. As a composer and as a singer, is there ever any time where like you compose something and you're like, okay, I need to sing this because this is a winner? <laughs> or sometimes you're like, you know what? Even though I'd rather it be for me, there's maybe it belongs to X, Y, and Z. So yes, and like I definitely could compose songs that are not my style, you know? But I find I don't really sell songs so much anymore. I find that singers are like suspect, you know. Why why don't you keep it for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it's still people I could show that my wares. Like we I recently you know, we just put out our Leif Khadash album, um, Purim Time, and Danny and I demoed a lot of songs, Danny Gross. And uh, we Donnie, Donnie, where are you? <laughs> Donnie's uh, like, I'm calling him out. He's like five minutes away. He could have come here. Could come, back. Could have come. Oh, he's busy. He's busy. He could have distracted us a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so I, I show songs. And I'm like, just because I didn't, you, when you're creating an album, you want every song to fit a certain, you know, mm. spot. So I do sell songs. I don't really write for others. Sometimes I do. There was a case when, you know, the song, um, Became quite big. Chazek or Shabbos Hayom Lashem? Shabbos Hayom, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, so. Who doesn't know? <laughs> Shlemy Gertner asked to come. He was coming to America from England and he was going around trying to collect some songs. He asked to come to my house. I'm like, I live in Waterbury. I'm like, like just please don't come. Like, I'll, we'll meet somewhere, but then, you know, never end up meeting somewhere. He says, no, we're coming. He came with uh, Gershi Ma. Yeah, his producer came along with him. Um, and. I like I feel bad like he came all this way. I knew this was like a good song. Rabbi the the Rav of Rashul and Water in Waterbury Bene Shalom, Rabbi Sun and Shine actually pointed out the Zemrif to me. He's like, it's a beautiful lyric. Talks about the day will come when you know the, the whole, it's gonna be a Yom Shakulo Shabbos. You show Eru Shum Renanai, the VM Kohan. It was like a beautiful and I was able to interpret the that Zemr into song. And I played it for him. He's like, nice song, nice song. And Gershi's there and like, yeah, very nice, very nice. And they're like, what else do you have? I play some more. What else do you have? I said, I finally told him, I said, guys, this is a good song. You like the, you like the guy who goes into the glasses store or, or the Borsolino store, right? And they're like, this is a hat for you. But you like, you want to try everything else. You want to try everything on in the store. So that was that story. So he got the song. He got the song. I don't know if people know that I wrote it. I sung it. Did I ever? I sang it actually on an album. My no, I don't know if I sang it on an album. I sing it. I sing it at you know gigs and stuff like that. I definitely know the song with your voice. With my so, voice. So, so then I, I I've done it at concerts and stuff like that. So from that one, I just don't let people come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, I actually have a list of like a few, I mean, you wrote, sure. a, you have a lot of songs, but I actually spoke to Donnie before because Donnie, I feel like knows you wrong, knows you well. Okay. So I have a few, you let me know if there's maybe a story here, maybe there's something, um, more emotional to it. Maybe, I don't know. I'm just going to list a few of the songs, Zakini that you sing, yeah. uh, Chasoif with yeah. uh, Shwaki, uh, Shabbos Hayyim, yeah, as you just, just said, <laughs> uh, Berch Zabayas, yeah. A.B. Uh, the Zakeni, the Bone Olam one. Yeah. Uh, the Vuhu Keli. Yeah. Um, like that's, that's a while ago now. Some of these are a while ago. Yeah. I mean, a bunch of these. And Rufua, Sing with Shwaki. Rufua. The Zakeni was, I mean, Yochi Briskman. Ultimately, you know, we were going back. I was going to Yossi Green. I was with Yochi for many years. He was an amazing producer. He really had a pulse on the Jewish music. He was like the king of Nagina. Like he almost like commanded what what's going to be played, what's going to be heard. So it was, and I you know related to his pragmatic and practical 
you know, like the art of music and the business. And, you know, I was learning in Kolo. I, I wanted to, I wanted my music to, to, to be spread, but I also wanted the chance to make a Parnassa. So he, you know, put, put out this whole album. Um, it's interesting. Even like a song like Vizakaini, um, it was liter it was the last song on the album. Not that it was the last song I wrote. It didn't register so much with us like, the tune is fairly simple. Fairly simple. Didn't register with us what those words would mean to the people then and how there was not like hardly a husband that knew what their wife was davening for, for their children. And it was at a time when, you know, children were struggling. Children are always struggling, unfortunately. But um, so that was like the last song that went on the album. You know, Yochi actually made a tweak. It's like the end of the, the high part. I originally wrote it, and Yochi's like, mm. you never know what a right. little, little thing like that wow. can do. Wow. He used to take my songs and say, he needs a little salt and pfeffer. Hmm. Um, and that song sat, the album sat a little bit. I remember at that time, the big wedding song was David Gabe. Yeah, bagpipes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Most famous uh, bagpipe Jewish song. Yeah, yeah. Na, 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 right? And Yochi's like, listen, Baruch. And he, he had no regrets. The song, the, the album was sitting, I think, for, for quite a bit. And the deal was a deal, no problem. He's like, but you need a hit, like Legabe. <laughs> you know? And slowly you would hear people, this Kala walked down to that song. And this person's walking down and it became like a Chupa song. It just became like Hashem took it and just like, I was like Zoha to be the Shliach of, of this song. And it was the shortest song I ever wrote. It was, we just had my, our son. The son is in Yeshiva. He's in camp now. And 17 years ago. And my wife gave birth and I was like, I was Nasragish, you know, I had a son. And in my parents' home, the piano is there and there's Hadlakas Neros where my mother bench is licht. And I just looking, there's a Kani Lagadil Banim. And I just wrote the song. Like I just wrote the song. It was like Hashem is saying, you're going to work on so many things in your lifetime. You're going to have projects and you're going to put shvitz into it. And you're going to want to claim Kochi Vatsim Yadi and like, this is from me. Hmm. It's really true. So that was that. And it kind of, it kind of, you know, it stuck. Abraham Berg always says, a song shouldn't be judged with how hot it comes out of the oven, but how warm it stays. Hmm. That's very smart and a very A.B. Rottenberg kind very, of line. That's but that, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot I of sense. Like, hey, and you asked me about so many other ones. I don't know. Um, Kasof, I wrote as a bachur. I was in Tomo. I learned in... Taras Moshe for three years. So much of my Chinachai tribute to Rabbi Meisel and the Rosh Yeshiva and the Rebbeim there. And we were lighting Hanukkah candles outside. And I was looking at the most stores. The first time I'm like, most store, it sounds Chinese, right? <laughs> most stores. And, you know, I was seven, 18 years old, whatever it was. I was first year of Maybe, maybe not, maybe second or third. I was there for three years. I don't remember. But, it just like, it struck me, like one second, there's a pattern here. We're going through the four galios, and then we ask Hashem, take us out of this galios. Stretch out your strong hand. Like often songs are like just written because it's like, wow, boom, inspiration comes, you know? I wrote this song, I recorded in one of those demos that my parents would, you know, sponsor me to do. Some guy in the mirror, his name was Yehuda Gellis, sent the tape to Yochi Brisman. <laughs> then I had already gone to the mirror for my fourth year in Eretz Yisrael. I was learning about Rebellion Baruch Finkel's, that's how. And I get a call in the Dira. Call, you know, the phone, the Dira phone. And uh, they said, uh, Baruch is for you. Yeah, hi, it's Yochi Brisman. Okay, this is before I did an album with him, which was many years later. Um, I want to buy the song, Chasayf. I'm like, oh, great, you know, yours, <laughs> right? Um, who's it for? Like, give me someone, you know, MBD, I'm from Freed. A new guy. What's his name? Yaakov Shweki. I said, what? Yeah. You know, he says, and then Yoko's like, trust me. Hmm. Trust me. It's going to go somewhere. And the truth is, that song stuck because it comes up every Yom Tif. 
But on the album, it was knocked to the end because there was another song that came out on that album. Rache, mm. that's not my song, but right. It's. So, right. but Shraki got it. Shraki got it, and it's great. It's his, uh, you know, like we say, uh, the Gemara says, "Buy a Zula Ploni. This house is meant for this person. Buy a Zula Ploni. This daughter for this person." I say, "Shir Zela Ploni. This song was meant for that person." Hmm. Wow, that's special. Okay. Something that you did that I, I that you and Donnie did, Donnie Gross, that I thought was really cool is off the record. So for people yeah. who don't know exactly what that album is yeah uh could you explain what it was sure. and why you did it it was something it was like a dream i had for a long time i grew up on music and the music that i loved wasn't resonating my kids could were appreciating it which was nice but when you want to like your kid to listen you you know a father tells a son you gotta listen to this old miami boys choir and that you're putting on this and the kid's like i can't listen to this you know um a classic song now, I, I was thinking to myself, one second, this song's amazing. Why don't you like it? And the answer is because it was like a whole different way of delivering music, the mm. technicalities, the way the sound was, and everything. Like I say today, even in, in class, like a good Rebbe is teaching the same way he taught, you know, in 1980, but it went from a blackboard to a whiteboard to a smart board. The clarity, the definition. Um, and there's definitely we're an ADHD generation, so we gotta mm. things were a little slower, and they went over too many times. And I said, I gotta, I wanted to take all of these English songs, my voice choir, Jep, Journeys, you know, M Moshe, yes, you name it. You look through the jackets. Just these these albums are like 80 minutes long each, which is like almost like a double album. I said, we'll put them in the themes. Um, and just like have a medley of Bitocho and have a medley on Shabbos. And it was also during COVID, I think. And people then were, like I'm, I'm usually a very forward thinking person. What am I doing next? What am I doing next? COVID was like, we're sitting and we're like, we're reflecting. People were taking out photo albums. People came at a time where like nostalgia was like, you know, we were appreciating what happened in our past. And I felt like in music it was the same way. And I called and then already I was on my own. I was with Yochi for many years. Um, I called Donnie Gross. We, we had done a few things together. We know each other from Camp Ray and, you know, eons ago. And I said, I have this idea and I have a name for it. He says, what do you want to call it? I said, you know, I want to call it like off the record. You know, <laughs> he's like listening. And he, how did I have that idea? It's like, it's just, it's like composing a song. You get, if you're a creative person, you get like, I don't know. Sometimes you need to be in a, you can't be, you need to be in a zone to have, like look, when you're being machadish, you know, something in Tyra, it's because you're, you're making space for it. And I was just like walking one day, I'm like, that's it, off the record. Um, and he's like, interesting, you know, interesting. We call, I called a friend who loves music and loves this stuff and he agreed to fund it. And he asked Don, he's like, am I going to make back my money? And Donnie's like, I don't know if you'll make back all of it, but you're not going to lose your pants. You know, <laughs> it did very well. It did very well. You know, um, it resonated with the world. We had also like these cute clips coming out of the studio with all these like men singing dove dove songs, you know, um, mommy, daddy, you will see. I don't know if you remember that song, but it was like, and, and people who were, it sold hard copies. Like people, middle aged people went for the first time in like 10 years, went to a store and said, can I buy a CD or a USB? I mean, that's like a whole different, that's a whole discussion today. Like yeah, CDs, USB, Music, streaming. Yeah. Um, and it did so well that we said like, when we did the first song, we said, we left so many out. Um, we didn't design to leave out for a second. We said, let's just make this one the best it could be. Um, but there was so many songs that we left out. And a year later we did Off the Record 2. Um, English Classics Edition. And now we're working on another off the record. Oh. Yeah. Well, I could tell you off the record. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> off the record that you're working on off the record. That's but awesome. It's not, not English anymore. I no, think it's very, exhausted. it's so innovative. It's so innovative. And it's also, like you said, it's like taking nostalgia, but it's, it's, Updating it, I guess, for these times, it's it's so smart. It's, and, I'm yeah. I'm actually surprised it took so long for something like this to, to come out. So people have done nostalgic albums, like you know, Shwaki did. Those were the days, you know. Um, there was nothing. 
I don't know, to, to do it in the format we did it in. Right, that's what I mean. Like, it, you're going to love Shabbos after you listen to all of these songs about Shabbos right. or Yerushalayim. And Donnie's an amazing, amazing producer. Just the way he was able to take, I don't know, there's 50, 60 songs on one album. And I, he, he has like magic hands and a great ear and he's a he's great vocal coach. So... I hope that we'll pair up and, and do another one. Amazing. Yeah. I'm supposed to record something by him today, Donnie. <laughs> Whatever today is. Yeah. Okay. Towards the end of the interview. This went by fast. I know. I was so nervous. Like, yeah, you were nervous. I never did a podcast before. This is the first one? I, the first one. Okay. I'm honored that you're doing it, it, an okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it usually goes by fast. I mean, there's probably, I know there's a lot more. We probably could do three more. Could speak yeah. about. You started off. So the story. So yeah. So with Yako <laughs> Shweck, a really cute story. When I was, you know, I used to go, I used to perform a lot, perform. Yochi managed him. He managed me. So we often were together in shows and one of my earlier shows, I'm like sitting backstage and feeling very good. I think I did a nice job and I'm sitting there, I'm learning and I hear outside, that was T4, that I didn't mean to, mean to say that. That's what I was doing. <laughs> um, there was, uh, you get so like self-conscious, like was that a T4, like you can't talk anymore. Yeah. I, I was sitting and learning, I was doing that. You right, know? yeah, you, you it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just. Can't talk anymore. Yeah. Anyways, this kid's out in the hallway and he's like, where's Baruch Levine? Someone take me to Baruch Levine, you know? And, they bring in this kid and he's he's got like a camera around his neck and he's got a pen and a pad. I'm like, wow, I might, you know, he's gonna take a picture with me, he's gonna <laughs> sign an autograph. And he says, You're Baruch Levine? I said, Yeah. He says, Could you take me to Shweki? <laughs> <laughs> nothing like a good humbling, nothing like a good humbling experience. Um, okay, the stories are great. Stories are great. Do you have another story that you that so happened? many like hard to rem- Yeah, I have like a nice when um an encouraging story that was for me when I was performing at one of the Hatzalathons, you know, during COVID. And Rabbi Waiwa Jacobson was, you know, we were talking before about Chinuch and being a celebrity, not being a celebrity. And I sing, I'm singing whatever piece I was doing. And he comes to me after, I don't remember if it was on the phone or if it was live, I don't remember, I'll remember. And he says, what do you do? You know, what do you do? I said, I'm, I'm you know, I'm singing. He, no, what do you do? <laughs> he said, you do something else. And I, and I said, I said, I'm a Rebbe. And he says, I could tell. It was, he says, because, I don't know, just the way, he said, you know, the way I sang, the way, I, actually, I was probably speaking a little bit in between the songs, and the way I was giving over the message, and he was, like, he really recognized that how important it was to, you know, a lot of people that influence are not with the people, they're not with the people, and I get to be, I'm with the people, you know, I'm going into school after singing at a, at a big stage, you know, the next morning, I, on a, I'm doing recess duty, you know, hmm. like, I, I'm... It's it's a very interesting life that I live and it's it's special, but it was like for people to recognize that was meaningful to me. Um, yeah, I don't know other stories. There was once I was hired for a bar mitzvah, um, in more of a modern ortho. You know, it was more than modern ortho. I'm not sure where it was. <laughs> it was. I, I, it wasn't in Waterbury. It wasn't in Waterbury. Right. And. My policy is that if for dancing, there has to be a mechitza. You know, there has to be just that was what my rabbanim told me that mm-hmm. for dancing, you have to have something there. And I neglected to tell the client that that was there was like a condition, and it was like my bad. You know, it should be in the contract. I didn't, you know, didn't. I, we're, we're we're close with all kinds of people. Like you know, I go around the country and sing for all crowds and all shuls, and you know. But this was something where I, I wasn't able to do, and they were very disappointed. Like, why didn't you tell us in advance? And you know, and at the end of the day, I said, "Listen, you, you obviously you don't have to have me, but I want to come. I'll come to you, your son's school, and I'll just sing for free, like for him and his friends." And and I really meant it because I really messed up, and That's I did. Very nice. Yeah, and they were very moved by that, and they said, "No, we want you with the bar mitzvah. And we're going to put up really." It was nice, you know. Wow, that is very nice. Yeah. A nice outcome. I mean, you could start like a whole cure movement of like, like accidentally telling them and then, <laughs> right? Then doing this whole thing. Listen, yeah, that was the you know, Rav says that's the halacha. That's 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 what I'm gonna do. That's very special. Okay, towards the end of the interview, I like to ask some fun questions. Uh, first off, out of the 630 mitzvahs, is there one mitzvah that is a little more? closer to your heart than the others right so like you know i know you're gonna ask i know that you do ask the questions i came a little prepared 
Um, I teach fifth grade and I teach Truma, Parshas Truma, and I teach Maseches Yuma. And both of those deal with the base of Mikdash and the Mishkan. My favorite mitzvah is Aliyah Regal. Right? It didn't happen yet. We should all be Zoha. But I'm like consumed with interest and filled with like Amuna over the Makam Mikdash, the base of Mikdash. I've been there to Yerushalayim so many times. And like you can go there today if you really understand the intricacies. Like other religions, they don't, they're not intricate. They, you know, you learn Mesechus Tambid or Mesechus Midos and you like, there was a base Medaj, and this is what it looked like. And even today, the whole footprint is there. And they, you know, it's just like now you could even go you do the three D yeah. thing. You know, yeah. I just, you know, it 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 helps me, and I I believe like teaching those masechtas also helps kids with their amuna. Like this was real. There was an arun, and there's it was the samos wide, and this ham this this samos tall, and it had these crew men, you know, and and so much of it is there. So that's like. That is cool. That is I don't cool. Know if you ever got that answer before. But. No, I don't <laughs> think. I mean, I. I this is the regular answer. I sometimes say, like, oh, I never got that answer. People on like YouTube comes like, no, you did in episode uh, 54. I'm like, okay, they didn't remember better than me. I don't think anyone ever answered that. It's, it's interesting that you say that because, like, I know me as, like, when I think, like, these kind of topics, at least when I was younger, it was always very hard because it wasn't, I guess I'm more visual. So these are, they're very visual topics. They're items. They're great, you know, yeah, for kids to teach. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. Right. Yeah. It's so important. So it's so important. And there's so many resources out there now that, you know, we know what it look. We know what a lot of things look like. Yeah. The mikvahs and the this, this it happened, and we're gonna right. be there again. That's beautiful. Okay, so what is the best advice that you've ever received? The best advice I ever received was when I started singing and traveling. I was approached by someone named Simchaman. Okay, he had an orchestra. He used to do all like the out-of-town weddings. Cleveland, I think he lives in Chicago or Cleveland, maybe Cleveland. And he would do Baltimore and Cleveland and Chicago. All these places didn't have orchestras. A lot of people now bring one-man bands or, you know, if they have a budget, they'll bring in whoever they want to bring in. But he would travel a lot. And he told me, he says, Baruch, you're, you know, you're going to be traveling a lot. I mean, you hope to be, right? You're going to be going, doing, concerts, events, whatever it is. He said, always when you go away and you're going to a hotel, he says, you leave the next morning back to your family, first flight out. You're out. It's not where you belong. You belong with your family. You belong with your wife. You belong with your children. You belong with your chavrusas. You belong at your minyanim. And you're making a parnas and it's a wonderful thing. You know, listen, I, I usually have to be back anyways. I'm teaching. But if you ever, have, you know, you don't linger. You're out. Um, another person told me, he says, like, if you're ever in a hotel room alone, you know, again, you never, you don't touch the remote, hmm. you know, I'm just like being very honest. And that's something like I started in 2006 and I kept that up. Wow. First flight, you know, I'm traveling this week. I'm going to be away in two places. And it's sometimes, you know, you go to sleep two o'clock in the morning. Like, why can't I just sleep in a little bit? And no. Out. Out. Wow. Back Beautiful. to the family. Beautiful. Beautiful. What about the flip side? What's the worst advice you've ever received? Um, I don't know. I don't listen. To, I, I try not to listen. To, I try to discern good and bad advice. There was once a singer that, like backstage, like a lot of, there's a lot of vocal pressure. Like, you mm. know, you're, you're singing, you want your voice to be good. There's a whole world of voice lessons and tricks and therapies and, and potions and stuff. And there was a singer that's like, I, I, it was. I've had years that were very hard. It still is sometimes because I'm teaching and I'm singing. You know, yeah, using your voice a lot, a lot. And the voice is a delicate instrument. Um, and as a reb, you're using it like crazy. You know, I, I train, and most people now are, are training uh, at least you know once a week, keep it in shape. So I was going through like a rough time. It's like whenever you sing, take three Advils. <laughs> okay, that was a bad advice. Advil is an anti-inflammatory. And I popped a blood vessel on oh my, my vocal, oh, <laughs> my vocal cords. I was singing like a bunch of, I don't know, maybe it was the summer where I was going from thing to thing. And when you pop a blood vessel on a delicate instrument, it weighs it down. And, you know, sometimes people give you like a quick fix or like, you know, Google medicine, you know, you Google your symptoms, look into it. Okay. Um, yeah. I had to have a procedure done. Oh my gosh. Baruch Hashem. Did so, you tell the singer you're like about it? No, he's, he's, he is a, he's a good he's very, he's a phenomenal performer 
his specialty is not in his vocal range. Uh, so it's it's different, you know. Interesting. What works for him. Right. It's not, yeah. It's not work for you. <laughs> okay, I want to finish off with one last question. First of all, again, honor that this is the first podcast you ever did. And and that being the case, um, I guess this is your, I mean, people hear your voice, but maybe this is the first time people can hear your message. So what is a message that you'd have for the world? A message for the world. I don't know if I want to give a message. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I get a lot of, of people sending me um, that their kids wrote songs. A lot, a lot, a lot. There's a lot of the people have the ability to make beautiful music today. And like, I get this question, like, how do I get it out there? And I feel like we're living in a world where the commodity is to get it out there. And I'm like, I'm, okay, I'm a big talker because I, I am out there. But, you know, when I grew up, I was, I took such pride in that my work was going to be shared with my family and my friends. And I was able to write a song that was played at my cousin's bar mitzvah. Nobody heard it anymore. And we're like waiting for things to go viral and the, and the, and the, and the, the taiva to like just be out there and known. And that commodity has to, I think has to come down a little bit. Like you have what to share, share with your family, share it with your friends. If it goes out, if Hashem wants it to go out there, it'll go out there. I have so many, by the way, even myself, I have like so many songs where I could like kvetch and say like, why didn't this song make it? Why? Hashem didn't want it to make it. Mm. That one, yes. This one, not. I don't know. This one's better. That one's not. So like so many young people that are like have talent, but they got to enjoy the talent with the people that are close to you. If, if, if the barometer is viral out there, you're going to be disappointed and you have so much to share and you have so much to enjoy. So I don't know. It's a beautiful <laughs> message that, that really resonates. Rabbi Baruch Levine, yeah. thank you very much for coming here. And um, to be honest, the whole thing, I, I want to talk to you, but I really just want Shrucky's number. From oh, this, okay. Uh, good. <laughs> no, good, good. I, I, I did him already. I, I did him. I, I, I interviewed him and, yeah. and now it's, I'm leaning up. I'm going Ooh, up. Oh, that's I'm, very nice. Know, I mean, he's you. great. He's great. <laughs> but the same thing, the times are changing. All right, let's see who's after me. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> Thank you, Yaakov, really. Thank you. You made Thank it very you. easy and enjoyable. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's episode. If you got this far in the video or the podcast, go ahead and use the code word SWEET. That's the code word SWEET in the YouTube comments. So I know that you got this far. Like I said, I, this morning I spent an hour going through every single comment on our Inspiration for the Nation video. So go ahead, drop a comment. And also let me know what your favorite Baruch Levine song is. I'll tell you what my my favorite song from him is, Baharevna, something that we forgot to talk about. And we are both heavily involved in Kenya Masachta. I actually saw him by the last Kenyam Sakhta event. It's basically uh, daily learning where you chazer, you're part of a chavri, you're part of a group. It, it, it's incredible. If you don't know what it is, go check it out. But I went to the farm after this episode. I actually recorded this episode on the same day as my wife's birthday. Happy birthday, Gita. And when we went to the farm, it was a Jewish farm, Gold Shines. Shout out, they're great. And they were playing the song, Varevna by Baruch Levine. And I took a video and I sent it to Baruch. Um, and if you see the living lechaim status you will be able to see the video i'll put it there and i'm like we forgot to talk about this and then i mess he's like oh, how could we forget to talk about it kiyam sakta it's something that uh binds a lot of people together and um i personally think that barach or rabbi barach does a great job at fusing together both being a rabbi, being well respected in, in the world of water barriers, the world of chinuch, and then he's also, he, he is a celebrity, whether he likes it or not, he has a beautiful voice, but I think he's so recognized as, as, as someone unique in the industry that he balances both of them, and I think that's really beautiful. And for that reason, I think he's an inspiration from the nation. If you did not get get anything from Twillery, go ahead, use the code word INSPIRE. You'll get $18 off and you'll help me beat my brother, who Ellie, who's also doing a promo with them and we're having a competition. I'll be honest, he's, he's winning. I mean, he did get a head start, so that's probably why. But if you could help me out and go ahead and order your new clothing for Yantif, your new clothing for Yeshiva, for Elul, or just to feel like the new you, go ahead and go use Twillery's code INSPIRE for $18 off when you uh, spend over 139 You can see the information in the link in the show notes. And also go ahead and watch Rabbi Rahimi's video um, linked below and go ahead and pick up the Chofz Chaim companion. I'm telling you, 
and and this is a, a, a promise from Rabbi Menashe, Rabbi Himi, your life will be changed. We've heard about Chavetz Chaim and the importance of of not speaking. I don't say speaking lashon of not speaking lashon hara. But there's it's it's such an easy thing to do, and the more we study it, the more we know our barriers of what we can and can't do, the better our lives are, and the more bracha and etzlacha we'll find in our lives. Go ahead and share this episode with a Baruch Levine lover or someone who's not yet into Baruch Levine's music, which probably is like maybe three people in this world. Thank you so much. You yourself can be an inspiration for the nation. And we have incredible, I'm not just saying this, we have incredible episodes coming up. And subscribe if you haven't yet. Peace out. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.